of other things would tell us what TV shows were in color, what was no longer on. Uh, they'd tell us about movies that we'd missed. Uh, just the ability to communicate was a very, very important thing. And I think without that, had they really been successful and isolated in this of each other, many of us would have not survived. Harry Jenkins almost didn't survive. He was dying of malnutrition when Stockdale and other fellow prisoners went to his aid. And I had a very severe stomach ache of some sort. And there was no position I could sit in that would ease that pain. <clears throat> and I asked the guards for morphine, and uh, they would give you nothing. And I finally was hurting so badly that I asked them, just shoot me. And uh, in the middle of the night, I wanted uh, some relief or something, and I hollered bow cow for the guard, and uh, no one came. And so the, the camp, there were 11 of us in this camp, picked this up, and it created quite a stir. Everybody was hollering. And the admiral took the brunt of this. He was accused of orchestrating this thing. Uh, and they removed him from the camp and, and gave him some pretty harsh treatment. As senior ranking officer of some 300 American prisoners at the Hanoi Hilton, Stockdale bore the heaviest burden of torture. In one session, his already broken leg was twisted and rebroken by his captors. Today, almost 20 years later, Admiral Stockdale is retired from the Navy, but he remembers the details of his torture sessions as if they happened yesterday. Their response is to come in, lock you in leg irons, but these have a long bar, they're heavy, and then, amid a lots of clamor, some slappings to the face, huzzas from a crowd that gathers, two torture guards will normally emerge, specially trained men, and start cinching your arms together with either with manila rope. And then he climbs on your back, forcing you flat into a V-shape, stands on your back, and then gets more leverage as he pulls your shoulders together to the point where you think your, el your shoulders are going to touch. And all the time, conscious of the fact that you have uh, uh, numb arms, which if, you're, if you've done it before, memory tells you will mean that you will not be able to tie your pajama pants for weeks or months, depending upon the amount of minutes these uh, limbs are, are drained of blood. And then he adds the fillip by taking his heel and pushing your head down between your feet, totally jackknife, where you start panicking, choking, maybe vomiting because of uh, claustrophobia. At some point along here, with claustrophobia, blood cir uh, circulation stoppage, and arms in distended into unnatural, painful configurations, there comes a time when you submit. These are North Vietnamese propaganda films. Many prisoners were forced, through torture, to appear in them. The people who rescued, who captured me, treated me fairly. Carolyn, I love you. They're treating me well. Um, Merry Christmas, Dick. You won't see Stockdale in these films because he bloodied his face each time they were to be taken. While he didn't ask the same of his men, he did insist that all prisoners go through a period of resistance before giving in to the demands of their captors. And that usually meant torture. This was a, a method of command in which uh, he wasn't setting goals that people could not reach. He understood that all people aren't equal. Some are stronger than others. and. Uh, and uh, he, he took that into account. Make them work for it. That is the slogan. Make them hurt you. Never leave that room in that torture situation unless you can say to yourself, I made them earn their pay. Almost 900 families, wives and families of the missing Sybil and Stockdale American did not know if her husband was alive or dead Washington for over eight months after he was reported missing. As her husband became the leader of the men in prison, she became the leader of the POW wives, spearheading a campaign for the release of the captured men.
Uh, the first Christmas Eve was really a very, very, very bad time for me after I got all the Christmas and Santa Claus presents under the tree. And I reminded myself that no matter whether Jim was here or not, that whatever memories were made were the memories that the boys were going to have of Christmases in the future. So I, I kind of gave myself a talking to and said, you know, you're, you must treat this like a business, that you're in the business of making memories for little boys. And we're going to do this as well as we possibly can. And that helped a lot. On rare occasions, prisoners were allowed to exchange letters with their families. Stockdale took advantage of these occasions to reassure his wife and send her his confidence and love. In a 1978 interview, Sybil Stockdale read one of her favorite letters from her husband. This one was written. My darling, Sib, please know how much I miss and love Stan, Jimmy, Sid, and little fellow Taylor. Also know that I love you most of all. Sib, I pray that you know of my pride in you and of my faith and confidence in your judgment in all matters. Your rearing of our four wonderful sons is a magnificent a achievement. Tell them of my pride and confidence in them. God bless you all this Christmas season. Love, Jim. I think another great obligation that I felt I must preserve the flame for was the love of the family. The Sybil's dignity and, and motherhood and uh, guts and rectitude uh, demanded nothing less. I had to come home in the way that would make my family proud. In January of 1973, an agreement between the United States and the Republic of North Vietnam was signed. The war was over, and the prisoners were going home. Seen here moments before boarding a plane home, some prisoners are getting their first glimpse of freedom in over seven years. Prisoners like Harry Jenkins and James Bond Stockdale. San Diego, February 15, 1973. They took me right to the microphone. There was no hugging and kissing before the speech. The speech was the thing. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain James Stockdale. We're so glad to be home. Our thoughts have been with you ever since we left, and they're going to be with you from now on. For just an instant, permit me to let my thoughts turn inward, however. Inward to these wonderful Americans with whom I've been in prison. I'm proud of their performance. We've fought together. We've laughed together. We've cried together. And we've prayed together. Thank you. After nearly eight years in captivity, James Bond Stockdale was home. The children he had left were now young men, and the America he lived in had changed. But friends, family, and the United States Navy would soon learn that they hadn't heard the last of this heroic man. The prisoners were home, and for a while they became the spokesmen of post-war heroism in America. I had a regimen of some 300 push-ups a day, at least in the last couple of years. Harry Jenkins on my left here had the dubious honor of sitting on a bench under which I propped my legs as I did a couple of hundred sit-ups. Uh, I remember we, uh, just a few weeks before we were allowed to come home, they, threw, they, we, they came in with a, um, a sports magazine of some sort. And there's a Green Bay Packer stuffing his hair into his, into his helmet. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this just isn't the way it is, but it was. <laughs> the only thing I remember really finding uh, uh, disturbing was the noise level of the country. It seemed like after all these years of silence that uh, there was a lot of unnecessary racket, not only from uh, mechanical conveyances, but particularly from people. I called it the big wide world of yakety yak. Stockdale had hoped to get his own ship but with the damage to his leg, it was not to be. Yet he was named three-star admiral and made president of the Naval War College in Maryland. About, uh, 
how good men die. He took the opportunity to challenge I mean, the popular yeah, assumption that if you simply act tough enough as a prisoner of war, kind of your captors will give up for, and leave you alone. I, that's not true. <laughs> There's no way. They are just as energetic and just as determined and just as uh, uh, aggressive against the toughest as the weakest eight years after you get there. When he retired from the Navy in 1979, Stockdale was the most decorated member, wearing 26 personal combat medals, including the Congressional Medal of Honor. Today, Stockdale is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. In writing about his Vietnam experience, he deals with a universal human issue, how to persevere through hard times with courage and dignity. This was the central theme of a book that he wrote with his wife, Sybil, about how they survived their ordeal. It was later made into a television movie. We, I think, have uh, had a great uh, experience in, in living a life uh, without regrets, now, now that uh, I'm home. Since his return from Vietnam, Captain Jenkins has retired from the Navy and works with a top defense contractor. He lives with his wife in San Diego, only a few blocks from the Stockdales. Jenkins says that friendship and trust were the keys to survival among fellow prisoners. People who've been in combat together form some sort of a bond that they would not have ever formed otherwise, no matter how much they knew of each other or spent with each other, because they've shared... Uh, I guess you just lived on the bitter edge together. And you can't talk about it or understand it unless you've been there. When comradeship ran so high and there was such an affection for each other among us guys who were victims of this thing, I thought to myself, you know, I wouldn't be anywhere else. I'm right where I should be. Stockdale will never forget being a prisoner in Vietnam, for he still bears the scars of all those years of pain and torture. But if a hero is a man of great strength and courage, then this man surely deserves the admiration and gratitude of his countrymen. From the darkness of a lonely prison cell, he preserved the flame of the American spirit. And in doing so, he has given us the rarest of gifts, a legacy of American heroism we can all be proud of. On August 27th, 1966, Lieutenant Commander Jack Fellows, United States Naval Academy class of 1956, was shot down over North Vietnam. Later, Admiral Jeremiah Denton would praise him as one of the toughest men in prison. Part of his toughness was an undying sense of humor. And on one occasion, he apparently convinced a North Vietnamese interrogator that John Wayne was a pilot in his squadron, but had refused combat duty and was ordered by the Pentagon to remain in the United States. Please join me in welcoming back home Captain Jack Fellows. Thank you. Uh, if you'll notice in the program that they handed you out, my name appears in front of Bob Shoemakers. Bob and I are classmates, and this is the first time it has ever appeared in front of Bob Shoemaker's name. <laughs> On August 26th, in my stateroom, I received a secret message, which was to be eaten and devoured. The message was from the class of 1956. It said, quote, find Bob Shoemaker. I launched off the Constellation the next day flying a Grumman A6 aircraft and found much to my dismay that Grumman has never built an airplane that can fly without a right wing. <laughs> Within 12 days, I had found Bob Shoemaker. <laughs> I might tell you, Bob...